Hello everyone and welcome back to Cobian History. Today we will be having a look at wall construction during the Middle Ages and throughout history. We'll start out by covering some professions that relate to wells, then we'll cover the importance of wells in the Middle Ages, then we'll cover how wells were constructed, how the first wells developed, and we'll finish by talking about how people decided where to dig their wells. So we will start with some terms for professions that related to wells. The first one is the well sinker which I've based this video around. Well sinkers were the people who dug the water wells. Then you also had the well wrights who produced and sold the mechanisms such as the winding gears and the winches which would enable a bucket to be lowered in the well and water to be drawn up from the well. And the next and final term I will cover is the well master who was in charge of the local well and responsible for ensuring clean water for the village or the area. Throughout history, wells have supplied the population with water and a walk to the well was part of most people's daily routine. Wells were used to access groundwater or water from underground aquifers. The water could have been brought up by a pump, but most commonly it would have been brought up using buckets. If you were rich or part of high society, you'd most probably invest in having your own private well. The best place to have a well is in the basement of your house or underground if you lived in a castle, as outside wells could be contaminated more easily and it was also easy for wells to be poisoned in medieval times. So especially for castles which might be besieged, it was important for your well to be in a safe location. When your castle or settlement was perched upon a hill or a mountain, it was even more tricky to reach the water table. Some of these wells had to be dug so deep that they even could take decades to construct. But it was worth the wait and effort to have your own clean water. And that's one of the reasons why we find some of the deepest wells of this period within castles. While underground wells were ideal, it's also common to find wells in the courtyards of castles, as this place was easy to get to for most people in the castle. The vast majority of wells until recent times were hand dug, and this dictated the diameter of the wells, as they had to be wide enough to accommodate one or two people with shovels digging down. After the digging was done, the walls of the shaft could be lined with wood stone or brick as well as other stuff to prevent any future erosions to the walls of the well, preventing it from caving in. And as a side note, wood lined wells were known to have been constructed as far back as the early Neolithic. This lining to the sides of the well is extended upwards above ground to form a small wall around the well which prevents people from falling in and also reduces the chance of contamination. Speaking of contamination, well diggers had to keep in mind how close they were digging to any cesspit, as waste from cesspits could seep through the ground and sometimes contaminate the water in the well which could form serious problems for whoever used the well as their water supply. The fancier wells, such as those found in castles, usually had a well enough lining to avoid any water from the moat or cesspit to seep into it. When building a deep well, suffocation can become a problem, as the deeper you dig, the further you get from fresh air, and thus also oxygen. In order to provide fresh air for the diggers, a dividing wall, usually of wood, could be built into the well shaft. Any gaps in this dividing wall were stuffed with straw and pitch to make it as airtight as possible. At the top of the projecting chimney, a fireplace was built, which sucked air through the shaft below as fire needs oxygen to burn. This means as the fire was burning and using oxygen, fresh oxygen would be sucked through the U-shaped shaft towards the fire. And thus, as the fresh air was sucked through, it would pass by the diggers, supplying them with sufficient oxygen to keep breathing. I have to put a disclaimer here that I found this information on Wikipedia and I could not find any source or other example of this anywhere else on the internet. 
So just keep in mind that I cannot verify that this was actually done. If you know more about this or know where to find more information about this, please let me know in the comments below. Wells didn't always look like the ones you might think of. Some were huge and even included stairs that would bring you down to the water table. One example of these kinds of wells can be found in the Italian city of Orvieto. This well contains a spiral staircase and 72 arched windows. The two staircases were constructed in a double helical design. So pack animals were led down one staircase where they could be loaded up with containers filled with water, after which they could take the second staircase back up. This well took 10 years to build and was completed in 1537. Wells date back to prehistoric times. The precursor to wells was probably a shallow, uncased hole in a dry stream bed. Humans are not the only creature to dig for groundwater either. Elephants, as well as other animals, have been observed to dig pits in dry riverbeds to reach underlying groundwater. And it's possible that seeing this behavior in animals is what brought early man to use these same techniques. For thousands of years, water well technology probably did not advance much, because early men were nomadic and these were only temporary water supplies. At this early stage of well technology, wells probably didn't get much deeper than a few meters, and would have been wide enough for a person to climb into and drink directly from the well. When pottery and animal skin liquid containers were developed, people could use these containers to lift the soil up to the surface while digging the wells or for carrying water up to the surface. This allowed wells to become deeper and eventually they tied ropes to these containers which were then lowered down to collect the water. Excavations from all along the Mediterranean uncovered wells that date back to around 1000 BC. These wells could be as deep as 20 meters and were usually lined with stone and cement plaster. Public wells were usually constructed in wider streets with the openings covered by stone slabs. A small opening was usually cut through the covering slab which allowed the jugs of water to be lowered down by ropes. Many shallower wells were unlined, however by the 4th century BC, terracotta lined wells became common. These well castings frequently had slots that may have served to hold the casing while it was being lowered into the ground, or it could have been used as a ladder so it was easy for the people cleaning the well to enter it. There were also a lot of Greek wells that were large enough to have stairs built in them, so you could walk down to the water table. Many early Roman wells were lined with wood, but later Roman wells used stone. When digging in loose soil, the Romans dug a cone-shaped pit, which was wide at the top and decreased in diameter as it went down. This was done to minimize the chance of collapse, and once the pit had reached its desired depth, the walls of the well were built up vertically from the bottom and the space between the walls and the funnel-shaped face of the excavation was filled in. Digging a well could take several months, so getting the location right was crucial. There are many folk tales relating to finding water, but in reality it's more of a guessing game. In most temperate climates, you'll hit the water table eventually in most places if you decide to dig down. It's just a matter of how deep you are willing to dig. However, there are ways to make an educated guess as to where to start digging to reach water faster. The following techniques were described by Roman engineer Vitruvius in the 1st century BC, but I imagine people in the Middle Ages might have used similar methods. The method of trial is to fall on one's face before sunrise in the place where the search is to take place, then supporting one's chin on the ground to look around the neighborhood. Thereupon digging is to be carried out where moisture seems to curl upwards and rise into the air, for this indication cannot arise on dry ground. 
Once such a spot was found, additional testing would have to take place before a well was constructed. A shallow test pit should be dug first, then the inside of a bronze or lead vessel was smeared with olive oil and the vessel was turned upside down in the pit. The pit was covered with branches and dirt and left overnight. The next day, the inside of the vessel was examined for water condensation and if water droplets were found, the digging could commence. Vitruvius also suggested that specific plants, such as bulrush, alder, reeds and ivy, also indicated the presence of shallow groundwater. I should probably also talk about water witching or dowsing. Although there is no evidence it works, dowsing for water remains a worldwide practice. The use of a rod for locating groundwater developed in the late 1500s to early 1600s in southern Europe. The practice spread to England in the 1700s and subsequently to the Americas as well. Unlike the L-shaped rods we tend to use today, traditionally dowsing was done with a Y-shaped rod. And people didn't just do it to find water either. Dowsing could also be used to find all kinds of minerals or metals in the ground. How it supposedly works is that the twig was tightly held in both hands and when the desired stuff, be it water or something else, was detected in the ground, the twig would turn downwards to indicate its location. This method is also sometimes called willow witching, as willow was the preferred type of wood for dowsing rods. And again, I just want to remind you that this doesn't actually work. I'll also make a separate video about artesian wells and how they worked compared to a regular groundwater well. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in other medieval professions, the link to the playlist is on screen right now. Or if you're interested in history as a whole, you can check out my channel to find a wider variety of topics. I'd like to thank my patrons for their support, especially my $25 patron Parker Dye and my $15 patron G David.